audience, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Frontiers of Science lecture. <clears throat> this is our last Frontiers of Science for the academic year, um, and we're putting together next year's schedule, and that should be online soon. So many of you may or may not know this, but um, the Frontiers lectures started as far back as 1967 and is our way of introducing cutting-edge research to the Salt Lake community. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Margaret McFall Nye, who is a professor in the Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's also a Marie Curie researcher at the Max Planck Institute in Bremen, and in her spare time, she holds a A.D. White professorship at large at Cornell University. Margaret received her Ph.D. from UCLA and, and had two postdoctoral fellowships, one at the Jules Stein Eye Institute at the UCLA Medical Center, and a second one at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography at UC San Diego. In addition to the University of Wisconsin, she has held faculty positions at the University of Southern California and also the University of Hawaii. And she's the only faculty member that I know of that has gone through the grueling tenure process successfully three times. Dr. McFall and I has a litany of honors and awards, too long to go through all of them, so I'll just tell you a couple. She's a Guggenheim Fellow and also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Her research focuses on the interactions of beneficial bacteria and their hosts. Her specific study system consists of squid and its bacterial symbiont. And her studies have taken her to exotic places around the world, including Hawaii and the Philippines. Tomorrow, Margaret will be giving a scientific seminar on her research entitled Squid Pro Quo, Mechanisms Underlying the Establishment and Maintenance of a Beneficial Symbiosis at the University of Utah's Medical School campus in the Health Sciences Education Building, room 1730 at 1215. And I believe it was circulating earlier, but if you need the information, please come see me after her talk. So Dr. McFall and I has been a champion for studies of symbiotic interactions between microbes and their hosts, and, off, and also an advocate for the power of interdisciplinary work. Tonight, she will address the broad topic of the essential role that microbes play in plants and animals, including humans. The title of her talk tonight is Animals as Complex Communities Making Peace with Trillions of Microbial Partners. Please um, help me in welcoming Dr. McFall Nye. Okay, can you hear me? Is it good? Okay, so first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Denise for uh, all of the hospitality and the invitation to give a talk here today. I'm really excited about this opportunity because I think it's really very, very important uh, for the scientific community to communicate uh, with the public as much as possible uh, so that we can be an informed public and make informed decisions. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is the field that, that I sort of tripped into. I began studying symbiosis, that is the interaction between animals and their microbial partners, about 25 years ago, and actually a little bit longer because I also did my dissertation on this. And as I was doing this, the field began to explode, and it was all a technology-enabled explosion um, due to our ability to know who the bacteria were and what they were doing uh, in complex associations. So is there anybody in the audience who hasn't heard that we are teeming communities of, of, of bacteria? Oh, I'm so excited. Because I have to say that, that it, it isn't 10 years ago that I would, I would talk even to, to, to groups of physicians. And physicians, the whole idea was that microbes were pathogenic. And so there's been a tremendous sea change. And the, to the topic of my talk today will be about the impact of this sea change and our thinking about the microbial world and how the microbial world is central uh, in biology. So basically, whoop, 
this doesn't work, I don't think. Okay, I'll just do this. So basically, uh, can you guys all see that? Is, it, is there enough? Um, so there's a big elephant in the room. Um, and so what I mean by that is that um, in the last few years, like I said, biology has become aware that, um, that we have been missing a whole element of biology that it turns out is extremely critical to the whole field. And so um, that's what I'm gonna be talking about. And one of the things that's really interesting is that at this point in biology, there are a lot of biologists sitting like this woman <laughs> with her book, ignoring this huge elephant in the room. And for me, it's going to be very interesting to see how biology uh, eventually begins to incorporate this new knowledge uh, into the field. So I'm going to start by telling you why I think uh, I'm going to talk about, it, you know, we're at an inflection point uh, that, that um, technology has brought us to this inflection point. So I'll give you a little bit of an introduction and then talk about our, these changing views, our changing ideas of our relationships between the, the macro and the micro worlds that we live in and why, why, we, why we haven't thought this way. And then finally, um, I'm going to talk about symbiosis itself from my own viewpoint. And I'm gonna give you an example using the research that, that I do <clears throat> of how a lab might study a symbiotic association. Okay, so let's get started. Start off by how, you know, all of these things out in the environment that are, that are, belong to the biological world, how have biologists classified them? Well, it has been largely driven by technology. And of course, in the beginning, it started out with what you could see. And so um, you, you had um, classifications into animals and plants in the beginning, and then animals and plants and what Leeuwenhoek called animicules. So Anton van Leeuwenhoek was the very first person to see microorganisms under a microscope. And actually, they, he was looking at your beneficial microbes in the inside of your cheek. He had taken a cheek swab and put it on his microscope uh, and, and looked at it. But he called them animicules, he didn't know what they were. And so we had this low um, uh, visual analysis, this no, low resolution, you know, just what we could see um, with crude microscopes and with the, with the eye. And so we classified the organisms this way. Then along, somewhere in the early 1950s, um, science developed the transmission electron microscope. And it changed the way we saw things, at least for a very brief time. So what we did was we started to classify into what is called the five kingdom model. So these are fungi, things like mushrooms and, and whatnot, animals, plants, and then um, uh, eukaryotic, you know, large microorganisms, and then tiny microorganisms like bacteria. And so there were these, the, everything was classified into these five groups. And the major proponent of this was this guy named Whitaker. And so this was fairly recent. And actually, up until around the year 2000, you could go to different universities uh, and look to see, look at their syllabus for biology, and sometimes they would be presenting the five kingdom model. I just did a, a, a sabbatical out at Caltech, and uh, they were putting together the questions uh, for the graduate students uh, to get the graduate students, you know, find out where they were. They were gonna take a little exam and one of the biologists um, asked the question on this exam, um, why biologists classify the, the, the biological world into five kingdoms. And it got passed around to all of the biologists and the microbiologists went crazy, I have to tell you. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. <clears throat> so right along in here at the, at the last phases of the 20th century, all of a sudden, we began to have the capability of defining, even if you couldn't culture a microorganism, you could define it by its molecular biology, by its molecular signature. And so this sequencing was introduced by Woes and Fox, um, and, and it was very slow when they first started it. They were pioneers, so if you expand the scale toward the end here, 
you have Whitaker, um, uh, Whitaker's model, Five Kingdom model, all the way up to here. And then Woe started to do this work. And in 1990, he published a benchmark paper that suggested that the whole biological world ought to be divided into three, three domains. He called it three domains. And these three domains are the archaea, the eukarya, and the bacteria. And in each one of those do domains, microorganisms are by far and away the greatest diversity. So what we see with our naked eye is but a patina upon the microbial world, which is extremely diverse and has been extremely important. <clears throat> and so, so what I wanted to, to emphasize here was that this is a very short time frame, completely technology enabled, you know, with all of our ability to sequence DNA, it's given us a completely new window uh, into the biological world. So interestingly, now, in the last seven years, we've even been more enabled. So what I'm showing here is in these last seven years, the application of molecular technology is really revolutionizing um, the way uh, we view things. So it's interesting, I, I've talked, while well, I've been on my visit here, I've talked to a, a number of faculty who are using this technology in their research. And everybody's aware of this particular fact. If you look, so DNA is, is in a series of, of letters, you know, that, that, um, if, that per megabase, in other words, per million base pairs of DNA, the sequence cost of that um, for uh, back in 2006 per megabase was about $6,000. Okay, now within these last, these five years here, the technology changed in such a way that it is now 10 cents to sequence a megabase of DNA. I mean, what a tremendous enabling thing for the biological community. We can now look at all kinds of things that we didn't have access to. And what this is, we're beginning to sequence, do full genome sequences. And in our lifetimes, we will all have our genome sequenced, I predict. And these, these will be available for us to determine whether or not we're gonna get some disease or something. But so technology has enabled a change in our view of the world, of the biological world. So this is what, this is Thomas Whitaker's wonderful contribution of, of how, how increase in our ability to visualize by uh, transmission electron microscopy showed us the details of the cell and it brought about this model. And so we thought that the vast majority of the diversity was in the fungi, the animalia, and the plantae, and this, these were minor players. And it's really interesting because there are so many of these organisms now. I was just talking to a new young faculty, Bill, today, and, and he was saying it's still, when you go out into the environment, it's still a tremendous discovery. I think, did you say, Bill, 30% of all the sequences are new sequences. So we haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg here, whereas with the animals, plants, and fungi, we're pretty close to knowing what we've got out there. But this was the old view. And this is the new view, um, or one of the new views. So 1990 to the present, because of the enabling of, of molecular biology, this is what the diversity looks like. And the animals, plants, and fungi are but twigs on this tree at the very tip of, of an area. And it's, it's amazing uh, how much our view has changed there. Now, what this is in some, the minds of some people is demanding something that is being called the postmodern synthesis. So the modern synthesis was Darwin, um, Darwin's idea of natural selection coupled with the genetic mechanisms, the underlying genetic mechanisms that Gregor Mendel um, brought to the fore. And so with those two things, we had something called the modern synthesis that still to this day is the way most biologists think biology works um, at an evolutionary level. But some, <clears throat> with the advent of 
whole, this huge ability to sequence all the, the, the um, animals and, and microbes and everything in the environment, um, it's become clear that the vast majority of the diversity is in the microbial world. So we've got this mi microbiology revolution, we've got a genomics revolution, and then beginning in the 1950s, we had a molecular revolution. And Eugene Koonin just wrote a book called The Logic of Chance. And in The Logic of Chance, he posits that we should be developing something called the postmodern synthesis because the major portions of the biosphere do not have vertical transmission of genetic information the way animals, plants, and fungi do. And we need to incorporate this information into our thinking um, as biologists that there should be, as, as he says, a postmodern synthesis. Now, I wanted to show you that there are all kinds of other views of how, how this ought to be put together, all the various trees of life. And there's a little bit of fluidity to this because of the fact that this investigation of the diversity of the biosphere is still ongoing. So one example is viruses. Lots of people are thinking that some of these really big viruses ought to be thought of as, as life forms and ought to be a, a, a fourth kingdom or a fourth domain. Well, and other people think it, all sh it should only be uh, things that are made up of cells. So, so the eukarya, so if you, if you look up here, the eukarya is where the animals, plants, and fungi are, and all of these guys have really complex cells with complex organelles and so on and so forth. These guys are, are much simpler cell forms. Now the eukarya, they, they, they're very limited in what they do sort of metabolically. So what we do is we take in food and we burn it using oxygen. And, and that's what most of this particular branch uh, or this particular um, domain does. And so they, they have a limited, um, and the plants do, do um, something slightly different, but we, we are limited in our metabolic scope in the eukarya. In contrast, this, these are what is called the electron donors and acceptors. In other words, they take in and they use things, different compounds, and they can use them in different chemical ways than, than um, what the eukarya does. And so this is just the bacteria. They do, they can eat almost anything. <laughs> and they can, they, they can use that to make energy. I mean, it's just amazing how many electron acceptors and electron, electron donors and acceptors there are uh, among the bacteria. And they, they do all these different, different metabolic things. So if you wanted to ask, what is the metabolic scope of, of the biosphere? In other words, what are the options that life forms have for things to use? You have to know and understand the, the microbiological world in, or, in order to understand those sorts of basic things. So if you look at microbes and you compare them to, to animals and plants, you would see that they have a series of traits. And they're small. Bacteria are typically small. This is, most of them have short generation times. Some of them don't. They have large population sizes. They have a propensity to exchange genes. So they don't always do it by sexual reproduction. They do it by just taking up genes from something over there. And they're metabolically versatile, as I mentioned. Multicellular organisms, in contrast, are large. They have long generation times, typically smaller population sizes comparatively. They have a propensity against horizontal gene transfer. It happens, but it's not very prevalent. And as I mentioned, they're metabolically limited. So, faced with these two different sort of strategies, I think by partnering together, which is extremely common, so by partnering, they, they increase one another's scope. So for about a very large portion of of the Earth's history, uh, microbes were the only things that were there. And so plants and animals evolved as a patina on the, on the microbial world. And they did so by not developing, in, in, they didn't develop in a vacuum, and they didn't develop without interactions. And there's a tremendous, what we're learning is that there's a tremendous propensity for animals and plants to partner 
with microbes. And it increases, it increases their metabolic scope. So you bring in a microorganism that allows you to live in the hydrothermal vents of the deep sea. <laughs> you know, you, that's the kind of thing. So the fallout of the genomics revolution then is the recognition that symbiosis or our propensity to interact with microorganisms is a general phenomenon in biology, very general. And so when I started out my career, I thought, oh my God, I'm in a backwater field. Well, that's fine. You know, I'll, I'll, I loved what I was doing. And so, um, but it's interesting that, that it's, it's come to light now that it's a very general phenomenon. And so uh, this is a friend of mine, Victoria Orphan, who's a professor at Caltech, and she happened to be wearing this T-shirt that I had to take a picture of her. Um, so the vertebrate body plan, the, this, the, the vertebrate body, has 10 organ systems. So you have a respiratory system, a, a digestive system, an integument for your skin. Um, you have an excretory system, you have an endocrine system, and so on. There are 10 such systems. <coughs> In, in the, that make up the human body. And um, they appear to have co-evolved with associations in the microbial world. So each and every one of those, there are only two of them, that's the musculoskeletal system, and I can't remember the other one, um, that don't have associations with the microbial world. And Victoria, standing here, you've, you guys, it's, it's amazing. Most people have heard this by now, and that is that if you look at the person next to you, next, sitting next to you, no matter what you think of those, that person, they're 90% non-human. In other words, 90% of their cells um, are microbial. And so you've got um, 10 to the 13th body cells or human cells with human genes in them, and you have 10 to the 14th bacterial cells. If you look at gene number, it's about one to one. There are about 30,000 genes in 10 to the 13th bacteria and 3,000 10 to the 14th. But the diversity, these are, when you, when you look at the 10 to the 13th host cells, they're all the same genes. You know, in other words, pretty much so. There's, there's, there are some differences, um, but um, it's pretty much all the same. Whereas these are, you know, say, a few hundred, several hundred different types of bacteria. And so the estimated gene diversity is for every human gene, that is active in this system, there are 200 bacterial genes active in the system. So what does this mean? Well, what we're finding is that they have profound effects on all of our biology. So the carriage in coevolution with our microbial partners impacts everything. And one of the reasons why it impacts everything, so there's this guy. Um, in England, his name is Jeremy Nicholson, and he's a big pharma guy, and he wants to make designer drugs for everybody. And so he, he decides that the way to do this is to characterize everybody based on their blood chemistry. So he starts out, goes around taking everybody's blood chemistry, and he's, um, he's, he's a chemist. And so he starts doing this, and he thinks, okay, I'm gonna get everybody's metabolic signature and then I'll be able to say what kinds of drugs would be suited to a given individual. So he starts looking at the blood chemistry, and he says, oh my God, 30%, up to 30% of the blood chemistry, somewhere between 18 and 30% of the blood chemistry is microbial products. In other words, the bacteria that are in your guts are so metabolically active, and that those metabolites are, are crossing the, the, uh, the, the gut wall and going into your circul circulatory system. So for me, what that means is that every cell in your body does now and has over evolutionary time interacted with microbial products. That's deep, that's really, that's really profound. Um, a, a tremendously profound effect on our biology. So up here, um, just showing a few, so here's your microbiota, and it's known that they really affect your digestive system. And so I'd highly recommend, um, there's a new book that's come out for the, for the I, didn't, I should have put a slide in here, 
but there's a brand new book that's come out for the general public called The Missing Microbes. And it, the, the author is Martin Blazer, who's the chief of medicine at Bellevue Hospital. And Marty Blazer wrote a book about his journeys, about learning about how, by living to sterile, a lifestyle, and so on and so forth, the human populations are losing their microbiota, and it's creating all kinds of havoc, uh, um, allergies and, and uh, autoimmune diseases and things like that. And see, the, the recognition we're now recognizing that we co-evolve with these organisms and require them for health, and that's the important thing. So you've got, they affect the immune system. Your immune system does not, does not um, mature properly without your proper microbiota. And they found that babies who are, it's, for those of you who are young, possible mothers and fathers in, in the group, they've now found that the first few weeks to months of life are incredibly important. And so babies who are born cesarean section um, have a very different microbiota than babies that are born normal vaginally. And babies that are not breastfed have a completely different microbiota. And they, are, they do, not, um, uh, do not thrive as well, and they ha have a greater tendency toward obesity and a whole bunch of other things, allergies and so on. So this is, these are new findings, but they're, they appear to be very robust. But um, one last thing is that um, in addition to all these other sorts of things that we now know that they affect, um, we've, the, the biologists are now finding that interaction with the microbiota is essential for, the, for brain development. So the development of the brain relies on normal interactions with the microbiota of the gut. And also, so this was a wonderful review paper that came out on what they call, what they're now calling the gut-brain axis. And so there's, there's a lot of information that a, a whole host of, of, of behavioral and psychological diseases um, are associated with the microbiota, including autism, depression, and, and a whole variety of other things. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really deep, it's really deep, and we're just beginning to scratch the surface now uh, about what's happening there. So, you know, when I first got into this and this started to come out, I thought to myself, well, why didn't we know about this before? And what, what are the sort of, what, what are the, um, the things that are holding biologists back from incorporating microbes into their thinking. Well, I, I think that there's a conceptual challenge that we all have. And that is in, in thinking about microbes um, as partners in health. In the mid 18th century, uh, 19th century, um, Robert Koch developed what we call the pathogenic microbiology um, field. And Sergei Winogradsky and Bayer Rink and a few others um, developed environmental microbiology. And there were others, you know, Louis Pasteur and so on. But the point is that in the mid 19th century, it became very um, cast in stone or that th there were these two, two areas or schools of microbiology. So microbes were either out there <laughs> in the soil, in the water, in the, or they made you sick. They were pathogens. And so this guy um, believed that you couldn't understand what an organism was doing unless you could take it out and put it in culture and study it in culture and then determine whether or not by putting it back in the organism it caused the disease again. So he believed in studying everything in isolation. This guy believed in studying things in their environment, in the community, so very different. Um, then along about, um, you know, in the 1950s, biologists began to use microorganisms to study basic molecular biology. And so then there was this, there was this third arm of, of biology. But with pathogenic microbiology and environmental microbiology, where do you put the concept of how animals and plants interact with, with microorganisms for health? There's no conceptual home for that. 
And so I can tell you, I, I had the privilege of running the, for the last six years, being involved in the running of the American Society of Microbiology meetings, which is a meeting of thousands and thousands of people. And you go into that meeting and you can see this footprint. It's very obvious footprint that the microbiologists are often very divided into these fields uh, based on this history. So, um, but we know now that they're widespread and evolutionarily conserved. They have a tendency to be extracellular, that is they live on our surface, the surface of our cells, whether on the surface of our gut cells or on the surface of our skin or on the surface inside of our mouth. They live along the apical surfaces. They are acquired, we acquire them anew each generation. So when we pass through the birth canal, we get our first inoculation and then we begin a typical ecological succession. And then by the, about the age of two to four, we have what is considered um, a, a mature microbiota. And then we have that, that group um, with us from then on. But there are these major questions beyond who, beyond who are they? You know, and that's what the, the field has been focusing on because in, in humans, they're really complex. So who are they, when are they there, how do, how do we mature our microbiota, what happens when we get old, and so on. But there are other questions. How do we harvest them? How do we pick the right partners? You don't just take in a random sample of the environment, you take in you know, a particular subset. How do you know them? How do you recognize them? And how do they influence development? What is going on there? How, once you get them, I'm sure everybody in this room's had diarrhea. <laughs> once you get them, how do you make sure they stay stable? In other words, that, that, you, that you, don't, you don't have a, a problem in your digestive system or on your skin or whatever. And so how is it that, that they, um, they don't overgrow the host, nor does the host eliminate them. Both conditions would be pathogenic. And then, for heaven's sakes, the bacteria that are living with you, almost all of the bacteria that are living with you are either part of the normal micro, the, the pathogens that you get are part of your normal microbiota that go out of whack when you're immune compromised or something like that, or they're congeners. In other words, they're very closely related to the normal microbiota. And so for the longest time, biologists have been studying when a pathogen comes in, the microbiologists have been thinking, okay, this pathogen comes in to a host and affects the host. And what about the other trillion <laughs> things that are there? And so, so this is a whole new concept in trying to, to figure out what pathogens do in the context of a symbiosis is a big area, very difficult. But what do biologists do when they're faced with a really, really complex situation? So one of the things that they tend to do is they tend to, to look at very simple examples uh, or what they call model systems. So the power of model systems is you can study complex characters that, get, that provide the rules for how things might work. And so what I've listed here, this is actually um, from a review done by Ned Ruby in Annual Reviews of Microbiology. And what he did was he was showing the Nobel Prize awards uh, in developmental biology. And it's really funny because I've shown this a couple of times and people have said, you got it wrong, you know, so-and-so actually won the Nobel Prize that year. And I got this from the Nobel website. So <laughs> if it's wrong, I don't know what to say. But from 1935 to 2007, here's the list of people who in the field of developmental biology have gotten the Nobel Prize. And the discovery recognized, um, I've put down here, and then the models that they used. And so you can't do experiments on humans. You just can't. And mammals are, are very, it can be expensive and it's very difficult to work with them. And so um, lots of things are conserved across evolutionary time. And so this is a really great way to figure out what the, what the very basic things, um, the basic rules of a complex biological problem might, might be. So what do we have in symbiosis? Well, we have some experimental models that are being developed 
and um, for the study of the colonization of sur animal surfaces. And so in the vertebrates, the studies of the vertebrates, um, which have, of course, complex groups or complex consortia of microorganisms or hundreds of microbial phylotypes, there are a couple of models that people have been using, and one is germ-free mice. And so they keep these mice completely sterile. And so they're able to control the types of microbes that go in, and they're able to study the responses. And they've, they've made great progress in understanding how we live with our microbes. Um, to give you an example, Sarkis Masmanian at Caltech has, and working with Paul Patterson, they found that there's a particular microorganism in your gut that can suppress, if, if a, a baby mouse um, gets that, it, it's a mouse model for autism, and you can suppress that, some of the autistic tendencies uh, with particular microbes um, introduced into the gut. So this is really powerful. Whether or not that will translate to humans is, is the next step, of course, um, but um, it's an interesting start. There are also uh, simple invertebrate systems, like the fruit fly. The fruit fly has only a few microbes in its gut, and you can hope to understand how those communities are put together and what a balanced community must be in a situation like that. So there are a few of those. And then I'm coming down to these binary systems. And the binary systems are where you have one microbe and one host. You have a population of one microbe and one host. And the power of the resolution there is that you can hope to understand what the conversation is between the two. So how many of you in here have seen a movie called My Dinner with Andre? Not very many. I'd highly recommend it. It's a good movie. It's, it's, there's not a lot of action. <laughs> it literally is, is two people sitting at dinner talking to one another. But it's, it's, this, this is an analogy that I make sometimes, um, and I'll make it tomorrow in my talk, um, that it's the difference between um, being able to listen in on a conversation between two people and trying to listen in to the conversation going on at a really, really big cocktail party. You know, all of trying to decipher all of the conversations that are going on and what they mean and all the relationships among these people it would be almost impossible. So I'm going to, to spend the rest of my lecture, the last part, just introducing you to the model that I've been working on for the last 25 years. It's been really fun. And to tell you what, give you an idea about how a biologist would use a model system to ask some basic biological questions about how something works. So here's the Hawaiian bobtail squid. You're from the Scolopes. And this is not a giant's hand. This is my technician's hand. So these are little tiny animals that live in the Hawaiian archipelago. And so we, my lab goes to Hawaii three or four times a year and collects this animal and brings them back to Madison, Wisconsin, and breeds them, and we get 50 to 100,000 juveniles per year. And we ask the juveniles how they recognize their bacterial partners. So this is Vibrio fisheri, the bacterial partner. And Vibrio fisheri is one of the marine bacteria that make light. And they make light by a particular chemical reaction and um, that light is used by the animal in their behavior. So these animals are nocturnal predators, and they come out at night, and they forage in the water column. And so if you were to you know, open up the squid, and do a ventral dissection, you would see a really complex bilobed light organ in the center of the mantle cavity. And deep inside of that, each one of these blue spots is a Vibrio fisheri cell. And this is the apical surface of the animal epithelia, here, and so these are microvilli that are supporting, that are where materials are transported out that support the growth of these bacteria. So these bacteria are gonna make light for this animal. So how does this work? What, what are they doing? So camouflage in the animal world is all about matching a random sample in the environment, right? So if you see a stick insect on a, on a piece of wheat, you can't see it because it looks like the wheat, right? So because we're terrestrial animals, we tend to think of, of camouflaging in that way. In the marine environment, the marine environment is very different. 
it's homogeneous. In other words, you're hanging up in space. It's almost like being up in the air, but you're hanging up in space and there's nowhere to hide, right? And so, so they have a series of, of strategies. They can either be, if you guys have ever been swimming with a school of shiny fish, you'll see that that's a way they camouflage. They can turn and all of a sudden they're not there. Um, and they, or they can be transparent. If they're simple enough, they can be transparent. Uh, or if they're small enough, they can be transparent. But the last thing that they do, really common in the marine environment, is a behavior called counterillumination. And that is that this animal, when it's foraging at night, it hangs up in the water column and it emits ventral luminescence that the bacteria make of the same color, angular distribution, and intensity as moonlight and starlight coming down from above so that they don't cast a shadow on the visual field of a predator looking up from below. So there's a lizard fish in the environment of this animal that sits in the sand and looks up and waits for yummy things to go by. And so it's like a Klingon cloaking device or something. It's a camouflage that these animals use so that they're not seen. And they can control light in two ways. They, the, ink, the light organ is, is sort of embedded in the ink sac and the diverticulum of the ink sac can roll back and forth like an iris and let more or less light out. And the other thing is that the all luminescent reactions in nature are, require oxygen. And so the animal can withhold oxygen to the bacterial cells and keep them, can make them dim or, or, or bright. So here's the study site. This is Oahu, Hawaii, and this is one of our study sites. It's uh, Coconut Island, or the Hawaiians call it Moko'oloi. And on these shallow sand flats, you can just go with dip nets and, and, a, and a flashlight and collect uh, the squid. And here's, uh, they'll lay eggs in the lab. So here's our lab, here are our tanks where each, each condominium has an individual squid. We mate the males and females, and then the females lay hundreds of eggs on hard substrate. And we, we take them away from the adults, and we incubate them. Here's a little clutch of about 200 eggs, and they hatch after about 20 days into, into juveniles that are just tiny, tiny, tiny things. And so we ask these major questions that I mentioned. And this is a great system for asking each and every one of these, and we've done that over the last 25 years. So to give you an example of the sorts of things we found, um, one of the things that we found was that interaction with the bacteria, and these are MAMPs or surface molecules. MAMPs stands for microbe associated molecular patterns. So they're things that only bacteria have and, and other organisms don't. And we found that interaction of the animal with bacterial products, and these are the receptors for those bacterial products, causes development. It's absolutely required for development of this animal. So, you know, of course I thought, oh, no, no other animal does this. <laughs> you know, this is, my, this is likely to be an odd thing. So I'm at a meeting in Paris. And of course, I'm jet lagged. I gave the opening talk at this meeting, and, and I was completely jet lagged. I sat down, and, and in my stupor, I look up, and the next person has a big squid on the screen. <laughs> and I thought to myself, wait a minute, <laughs> this guy works on mice. And what he was, what he was saying was that it had, it had long been known that, um, that mice, the, the maturation of the gut by mice required interactions with gram-negative bacteria, but they never knew why. And so Girardi Barrel, this, this young scientist at the Pasteur said, hey, if a squid can do it, maybe a mouse can do it. And in fact, what Girard found was that the exact same molecules that drive development in the squid drive development in maturation of the gut. Of, of mammals. And so this is to say, I mean, who's surprised? You know, I, I, that was kind of an idiotic thing for me to think nobody else did it. Because the interaction of microbes with animals is from the beginning of animal evolution. And so that there should be conserved mechanisms is not at all surprising. So also, 
micro, the pathogenic microbiologists studying pathogens have a language that has developed, and they call a whole bunch of things that, that, they, that bacteria do, they call them virulence factors when they perturb animal cells. And they call everything that the host does in response host defense, as though some kind of war is going on. And in fact, um, the, all these things I've listed here, MAMPs, this is, these are outer membrane vesicles of the bacteria, bacterial motility, the capsule, quorum sensing, and all of these things of the host, these pattern recognition receptors and so on. All these things have been ascribed to bacterial pathogenesis. And all of these things happen in the squid in response to interaction with their normal microbiota. And so it sort of calls for the pathogenic microbiologist to step back and say, well, wait a minute, maybe this is just the language that animals and bacteria use to communicate with one another, and it's the way the language is used, whether or not there's too much of something or too little of something, that causes pathogenesis, rather than the language itself. So it looks like the language is conserved. The last thing, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about this because this is really fun. Um, you all know what circadian rhythms are, right? Does anybody not know what a circadian rhythm is? It's a daily rhythm on your biological activity, okay? And so um, what we found is that the symbiosis is under a complex circadian rhythm. So remember I told you that the, that the animal is a night active predator. Right? It comes, it forages in the water column at night and, and matches moonlight and starlight. Well, during the day, the little guy, I hope you can see this, the little guy goes down to the substrate and buries in the sand. And he, first he sort of excavates and then he takes his tentacles and he goes like this and uh, covers himself up. <laughs> so they cover themselves up and they cover themselves up so well that if you open one of those condominiums in the middle of the day and you look for this animal, you cannot see it. <laughs> on the, in, in, in there's only, you're only looking at that much sand. They really camouflage during the day. So they have this profound um, diel rhythm. And the other thing that happens is when they do this burying in the sand that I showed you, when they do this behavior, around the same time is that they're doing this, is they vent 90 to 95% of the bacteria that are in, the, in their light organ into the surrounding environment. They just get rid of almost everything and the thing that's remaining inside grows back up. So it's really interesting because they, they do this, this every single day of their lives. So what the, what's happening then is they have the, uh, there's a diel rhythm on the association. So this is the population of bacteria inside of their organ. So they, um, during the day, after they vent them, so they vent them each morning, and then they grow up while they're in the sand. And they grow up so that when they come out at night, right here at dusk, they have a full complement of bacteria and they're ready to go in, in camouflage. So they do this every single day. So what we did was we asked how the bacteria and the animal talk to one another over the day-night cycle. And what we found was that they, they, they influence one another's gene expression. There's a huge change in gene expression over the day-night cycle. So we, I had a postdoc in the lab who looked at four different times of day at what the bacteria were saying and what the animal was saying. And you can see that right after dawn, or just, excuse me, just before dawn, there's a huge increase in host gene expression. The, the bacteria don't change too much. And then after dawn, there's a huge change, and there's a huge downregulation of a lot of host genes. So what was really interesting was it turned out that just before dawn, everything gets disrupted. The whole system looks pathogenic. If you were to, were to show this to somebody who studied um, the E. coli that cause um, E. coli K, you know, the um, 0157, you know, that causes uh, a problem if you eat the hamburger, um, that's what the cells would look like. Very disrupted. 
the, their microvilli have been effaced off the surface. And then over the day, those cells completely reform their microvilli and everything becomes happy again. So it looks like it goes from pathogenic to, to beneficial or benign, pathogenic, benign. Then that's what the animal cells are doing. How do the bacteria respond to this? What the bacteria do is they respond by turning on all the genes that allow them to eat these bacterial membranes. So what they do is they, just after there's venting, all these membranes are left behind. The bacteria that are left behind grow on all those membranes. They turn on all the genes associated with being able to do that. Once they re reform everything, all those microvilli, all those membranes are used up. The animal then begins to feed them chitin. And so there's every day, there's this really profound rhythm. Chitin, uh, it's anaerobic respiration of glycerol phosphates and then into chitin utilization, anaerobic, anaerobic fermentation, excuse me. So we got these rhythms in here. What are the cues? What are the cues that fish or I might use, I mean, to entrain Escolope's rhythms? I mean, what, what, how might this work? Well, I had this really great student in the lab who found a gene, a clock gene. And clock genes are genes that are, see blue light, and the bacteria make blue light. And so um, these, these particular genes are called cryptochromes, and they are blue light re receptive, and they entrain circadian rhythms, or they're involved in the clock gene entrainment of circadian rhythms. And so V. fischeri emits at this wavelength. Now, cryptochromes are generally used, like in mammals and things, and in humans, cryptochromes are in the head, and they cycle with environmental light, and they're associated, they're, they're entrained by environmental light, and they, they the transcription, they um, are involved in transcriptional regulation and the circadian clock. And so these clock genes are typically in the head. So she finds a cryptochrome in the light organ. And so um, she finds actually two cryptochromes, one here and one here, two different kinds, and it turns out that this kind is in the light organ and this kind is in the eye or up in the head. So she asked the question if cry expression is regulated in the head. In other words, does this animal have the kind of circadian rhythms that, that mammals have, that humans and mammals have? And the answer was yes. And they're entrained, typically they're, they're very highly expressed. Um, they're entrained by light and they're very highly expressed during the light cue. So yeah, behaves just like, you know, their, their, their circadian entrainment is just like humans. The cool thing was that, um, that cry one did not cycle in the head, but cry two did. So it looked like there might be a difference in the two situations, and indeed there was. So if you look at cry one, that one cryptochrome responds to the luminescence of the animal which is offset by the, by the light of, in, of the environment, you know, sunlight and moonlight, by about 12 hours. And how cool is that? So this animal, because it has a luminescence, and that luminescence is different, it, it also has a circadian rhythm, but there's a circadian rhythm that's run by the sun, and there's a circadian rhythm that's run by the bacterial symbionts. So um, this, this was the first time that any, anyone had shown that bacterial partners can entrain circadian rhythms in their host. So Elizabeth was pretty excited. So she also localized it, and here's the crypt where the bacteria are, and she localized it with an antibody showing that the protein, the cryptochrome, is in the right place um, to be responding um, to, the, to the bacterial light. Now, then you could ask a question. Are the bacteria necessary for that clock gene to be cycling in there? It could be completely um, endogenous. It could be an endogenous rhythm that, that that tissue just has, even if the bacteria are not present. Well, Elizabeth found that only when the bacteria are present do you get cycling of the cryptochromes in the same way. 
So that was pretty exciting. So what about the bacteria? So we, we can make mutants of the bacteria that don't make light, which is very rude, because then they're not doing their job. But you can do it. And so what happened? And the answer was, in the absence of light production by the bacteria, they, could, they didn't cycle. The cry genes did not cycle. So not only did the cycling of this clock gene or the circadian rhythm of the organ require bacteria, it required bacteria to be making the blue light that is the, that is the inducer of the cryptochrome. So she could take the Lux gene and by shining light of an LED array up from underneath, she could complement the Delta Lux. So it was light. Um, Interestingly, she asked, for those of you who are microbiologists in the audience, she asked the question of whether or not light alone would cause cycling, and the answer was no. And so what requires cycling was the presence of MAMPs and light. So the presence of the bacteria presenting bacterial products uh, prepares the, the animal tissue to be able to respond to the light production by the bacteria. I mean, so, so is this a general phenomenon? Well, daily rhythms of symbiotic-associated tissues, in, in my mind, are very likely to be conserved. So this is, this is what I've shown you, this really profound rhythm. Do they occur other places in the animal kingdom? Well, here's a mouse. And because biology has been so siloed, there was a group of people studying the innate immune system who looked at transcriptional regulation. In other words, looked at how, what the host is doing um, on a day-night cycle uh, in the immune system of the gut. And they found tremendous changes in the, tran in, in the transcriptome of the day-night cycle, huge changes. These guys, not referring to these guys at all, studying the gut epithelium found tremendous circadian rhythms on the gut epithelium at the molecular level. And so they're missing the third the th third element of that stool, and that last, that last element um, are the microbes there. And so the question is, do the microbes, as they do in Euprimna, entrain the circadian rhythms of mammalian hosts? Or are, at least, are they at least affected by them? And so um, it's been shown in a couple of animals that, that there, there is some entrainment. And so um, it, it's funny because we came out with this paper. Like I said, it was the first um, um, discovery of, of the entrainment of circadian rhythms by uh, animal circadian rhythms by the bacterial partners. And just recently, um, this mucurgy uh, paper in cell and then this year there have been a couple of more, that it's now become very clear that the, that the workings of the innate immune system and the epithelium of the gut um, are under circadian control induced by the bacterial symbionts. Now, we might have known this because there's a very interesting phenomenon that was, was discovered several years ago, and that is that the mammalian sleep cycle um, has a series of waves in it. And um, you go through a series of things uh, in, in, in your sleep cycles. And it was found that there was an element circulating in, in your bloodstream that, set, that was responsible for setting certain portions of that cycle. And they went, this was like 15 years ago, they went and isolated that. And it turned out to be the peptidoglycan monomer, in other words, a, a cell wall component of bacteria is responsible for setting the third wave of the mammalian sleep cycle. So you can take rats who are, who, um, are, are uh, germ-free, and their sleep cycles of germ-free mammals are notoriously messed up, and you can inject um, small quantities of this peptidoglycan monomer into their circulatory system and their sleep cycles and train. And so, so there's, there's growing evidence that there's um, um, really uh, strong circadian control of, of symbiosis and, and that the bacteria are really involved. 
So then I hope that I've convinced you that biology is at an inflection point. This is a really, really exciting time to be in biology. I actually um, was on a study section, uh, not a study section, I was on an NSF panel um, in the early to mid 90s. And there was a comparative physiologist with me. We were on our way to dinner. And he said to me, isn't it too bad that we have to run, have our career in biology when all the important discoveries have been made. <laughs> and I'll never forget looking at him and saying, that is the most foreign thing <laughs> I have ever heard. That is so foreign to me, I can't, I can't even go there. I, I, because I felt like I was, I was in the middle of not understanding anything that was going on and that there was such a big frontier. And so this is a big frontier. And, and so my feeling is that we need to lean in to this and that biologists should embrace this because this is actually the way the biological world actually exists. And if students of biology understand the microbial world, they understand the history of the biosphere. They understand the metabolic scope of the biosphere. They understand the very basic cell and molecular biology of the biosphere. And so, um, for my mind, every biology major should, should that microbiology should be a, an essential part of every undergraduate um, training. And I feel like we're in this postmodern synthesis. And that symbiosis is, is, a, is a really, really great field to be in right now. As all of you know, or many of you know, um, science, funding for science is becoming very limited and, and it's, it's a difficult road to hoe, road to hoe right now. Um, but this frontier is huge and there are so many opportunities in this field right now. Um, I'm very, try to encourage um, junior people to go into it because I think um, it's a really great field at this point. And uh, I'm gonna just close with showing um, the picture of uh, the 25th anniversary of the study of the squid vibrio system, a whole bunch of my academic children and grandchildren and their children and so on came back, uh, those, of, those who could come back and, and we had a big celebration of um, the, thinking about the fun times we've had studying this little animal, um, the star of the show. So thanks and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks for that great talk. I'll, I'll walk around with a microphone so that everyone can hear you. Uh, a couple of things you said are real interesting. You, I think you first said basically that 90% of bodies are pretty much bacteria. By cell number. By, but, but that ought to be pretty translatable to weight, not one for one. Uh, weight, we're about, um, my, I've heard something like 8 to 10% or something like that. But my question is, you got these sterile mice. And I, I accept everything you said about how important the symbiosis yeah. is, but I've got two questions. Yeah. How can they survive and shouldn't they be really little? So they survive, but with a lot of help. And so they have to be given particular diets, you know, they have to be given vitamins, they have to be in. And if they are let loose, they're like the baby in the bubble. You know, if they get let loose out into the environment, they'll be, they'll die from, from having no immune system to speak of, or no, you know, active immune immunity. Um, the other thing is that if you look at their tissues, there's a great um, biologist, Andrew, um, Andrew McPherson, who's done a beautiful review of all of the perturbations of the germ-free mouse in the absence of its microbiota. And it's pretty impressive. Nothing, you know, its digestive system is just a disaster. You know, they, they're, psychologically, they're whacked out as much as you could recognize a mouse being whacked out. But, but it, they're, they're, they're very, just about every aspect of their biology is, is, is abnormal. Yeah. But they can live. They can live with all this help. You know, you have to give them all kinds of things and treat them like they would, they never, they can't make it. Yeah. 
So has this new understanding of symbiosis uh, entered the livestock industry where there's been a tendency to overuse antibiotics? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so antibiotic usage, as, as we all know, is, has gotten so out of control and the antibiotic resistance has gotten to the point where, you know, we're in a downright dangerous situation. Um, and a lot of it comes from, from they, they give antibiotics to increase, uh, there has a, it has a tendency to shift the microbiota of the cow so that they deposit, they fat more readily or whatever, um, or, or muscle more. They grow better on antibiotics. And it's that they, they're just out of balance. They're not in a normal situation. They're in a feedlot or something. And so, you know, it's, it's been a strategy and they really don't want to stop because they've created a bit of a monster, of course. Um, and another really good example is I was invited to the um, aquaculture people of, you know, and they, they were at wit's end because they had been told that they could not um, flush out the, the water, they, they, they had to circulate the water, they couldn't keep putting it back into the environment after it had gone through the, through the hatchery. And so they, they wanted to know what to do, it was gonna be too expensive to do this. And the, the tendency had been to, to treat the water with heavy antibiotics. <clears throat> and what the fish farmers were finding is what every good Filipino fish farmer would tell you. And that is that, that they do a lot better uh, in microbial rich um, environments. And so when you, it, it's sort of the opposite of mammals. Um, they do super well. Fish, fish grow up to five times faster if they're in microbial rich environments. And so the, this usage of antibiotics is really dangerous and is coming back to bite us. And uh, yeah, I mean, there are some, something, you know, MRSA and MRSA and things like that. We're at the last ditch efforts of antibiotics for certain things. Um, yeah, I just had a question. You mentioned the symbiosis between the bacteria and our gut systems. Yes. Has there been much research into things like how diseases and viruses can upset that or change that structure? And yeah. What have they done so far to try so, and figure that out? Yeah, there's some really, really interesting things. So people have been studying what happens to humans. So like in the skin, what happens to the skin microbiota when someone has psoriasis or something like that? The microbiota is completely abnormal. There's no question about that. Um, and so there's a lot of study of um, IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, and Crohn's disease. Um, in, in those situations, there's a lot of information about what's happened um, to the microbiota. Typically, the microbiota are different and they're less diverse. So diversity, high diversity of your microbiota is a, is a signal that you've got a hel very healthy microbiota. And this is one of the things that um, Marty Blazer, this guy from NYU, has brought out is we're, we're losing our microbiota. And uh, it's, that loss of diversity is, is compromising our health. Yeah, and so the, the very best experimental work, in my mind, has been done in a lab at uh, University of British Columbia, a guy named Brett Finley. And what Brett did was he was working with mice, and he took not a human pathogen, he took a mouse pathogen that behaves very similarly to um, the hamburger E. coli. And um, he asked what happened to the gut microbiota of the mouse when it was given this Citrobacter species, which is the... the um, the pathogen, and um, they were able to follow uh, the, the decline in diversity and the change in the microbiota as a result. So one of the problems with, with having antibiotics or taking antibiotics is that you knock back certain things and um, you do, the vast majority of your microbes are retained in reservoirs of the mucosa and within two weeks you're pretty much repopulated. The problem is there are microbes in there that either when you're on the antibiotics can bloom and become dangerous like Clostridium difficile or um, never come back.
you know, there, there's some subset and the extent to which you've lost really important ones. Um, and so this, this turns out, so I was at this meeting in Washington listening to all these guys, physicians and whatnot, talk about this. And I was telling you about the first two weeks, or first two weeks to months to, you know, that those very early period in life. Uh, they've, they're now following children who have had antibiotics, you know, in the, in the very early stages of life. They're following them later into life, and it's pretty impressive. Um, so they, they showed that, for instance, they, sh they looked at a cohort of infants, um, and half of them had, uh, some subset of them had antibiotics um, in the first two weeks of life. And then they looked at the cohort who didn't, did not have antibiotics in those first two weeks of life. They looked at them a year later, and a year later they still did not have normal microbiota even though they had, not, had no more antibiotics after that. So there's something extremely critical and important about the first few years. Now, Jeffrey Gordon um, at Wash U um, found this, that this is the reason why when children starve in non-industrialized nations, when children go into starvation, they go, they spiral down, and they, they just cannot pull out of it. And the, what happens in children is they don't have a completely mature microbiota, and so they start t taking things in, and um, they establish an abnormal microbiota. And he found that if he had normal children that didn't, who were not um, starving, and, and, and children that were starving, in these uh, that had been eating the same diet, but then he, they gave them supplements, you know, to, to try to get them back up to normal. The kids who who were starving could not be, would not recover, would not recover. So what he had to do, what they found out they had to do was they had to give those kids antibiotics and clear them out completely and give them back the normal healthy microbiota of healthy children, and then they could recover. And so what this, this says is that children, um, during the time just Actually, it's somewhere between the ages of two and four that they mature that, their microbiota, and that's probably why they're not quite mature yet, and so they, they can't, when they begin to spiral down. Whereas when adults starve, they can go into these long starvation bouts in prisons and, and so on, and you know, once they, they stop, they have re reservoirs of their normal microbiota, and they can, they can come out of starvation. Um, I wonder if you'd consider sort of a disciplinary mindset question. Yeah. Um, in the field of ecology, it seems like from the beginning to sort of the mid-development of ecology, competition was the way I think people viewed the world, that, mm -hmm. you know, and, and elementary textbooks always start out with competition, and this is, you know, which, which species goes extinct. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really until just maybe 20 years ago that people like Doug Butcher and Ray Calloway began really considering that symbiosis and mutualism is a really strong factor in, in right. evolution and ecology. Right. So I'm wondering whether you see a shift away from that in terms of what you've been talking about as a dominance of, yeah. of symbiosis and even mutualisms and this sort of giant living together yeah. in, in the field as you've described it. Yeah, I think, I think you know, I, I actually, you know, uh, when I was in graduate school, I took a lot of ecology, and it was a lot of competition and predation and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And... Um, I think that those things, of course, still exist, and, and there's, you know, those many of those principles are, you know, they are. Um, but I think at this point we need to start um, incorporating in the idea of cooperativity more and symbiosis, and and you know, what a symbiosis can do is increase the c competitiveness of an organism, right? Um, and so if, uh, particularly nutritionally based symbioses, uh, the, the better you are at, at extracting um, carbon from your symbionts, if, if you're in nu nutrient poor waters, the better competitor you're gonna be. So it, it all sort of <clears throat> works in there, in, in my mind. Um, I think we, we need to begin to think of the biological world as nested ecosystems. That um, the, the ecosystem that is 
this <laughs> is nested in the larger ecosystem of, you know, if it's some, some mammal that has complex microbial um, consortium associated with it, that is nested within, you know, another larger and larger and larger ecosystem. And what we focused on um, is, is, is rather modeling ecosystems based on individuals, as far as I can see. Great, thanks. Yeah. With young children who've had um, sickness or disease and who've been on antibiotics, is, is there a way to feed them foods that will, can you, you restore some of the gut flora, the, yeah. what they need in their bodies? Yeah, so, um, so there are some ways that you can, you can do that. Um, it's becoming more pre and probiotics are becoming very much more accepted. There, there were there were times when that it wasn't realized that there were strain differences among these probiotics, and some of them would be very effective, and some of them wouldn't. And so, um, a lot of doctors will, you know, like even see commercials with uh, Jamie Lee Curtis on <laughs> doing Activia commercials. You know, there is, it has been shown now that there's some efficacy to that. Um, in extremis, um, right before dinner, should I talk about fecal transplants? <laughs> so so um, it turns out that a lot of people, because of antibiotics and antibiotic resistance in a microorganism called Clostridium difficile, which is carried by about 19% of the population. You go into the hospital, they give you antibiotics, your C. diff blooms, and you've got a C. diff infection that's antibiotic resistant. And it's, it's life-threatening. And so, um, and there are people who get IBD so severely that it's life-threatening. And they have found recently that fecal transplant is 95% efficacious. It's incredibly efficacious. So I was back at that same meeting where we were sitting around talking about the young and all this. The one, there was an announcement at that meeting that the FDA was, the FDA was, was considering putting a ban on fecal transplant until they figured out what was in there. Um, <laughs> to, you know, they wanted to control everything, right? They want to control everything. So um, the, the physicians went berserk because you've got somebody dying there, <laughs> you know, and you can do this, and I'm not kidding, this guy um, who gives us talk about, about this therapy, I mean, the person within two days is completely normal, whereas they were wheelchair-bound before that. And so the physicians went crazy, and the FDA has backed off. And so there are, like at, at the Madison Digestive Health um, Clinic, that's something they do, and so if, if if it's bad enough, um, there is there are things you can. There are different levels, I guess is my point. Different levels of things you can do. But not for the children starving in Africa. Over oh, the children starving in Africa, the thing the thing that Jeffrey Gordon found worked was they had a disrupted microbiota, and so what he found that they had because they were starving and their immune systems were not mature and they hadn't established a normal adult microbiota, which happens between around three or four, <clears throat> they were spiraling down and because they had this aberrant microbiota. He then cured them of that aberrant microbiota with um, antibiotics. He got rid of all that bad stuff and then gave them the microbiota of healthy children, and they were cured. Yeah. So, you know, if he doesn't get the Nobel Prize, <laughs> I sort of feel like, you know, that's quite a contribution. Yeah. Let's take one more question. And um, since Margaret mentioned dinner, she must be getting hungry. <laughs> what do you recommend to counter the growing prevalence of autoimmune disorders in the civilized countries? So that's a really interesting question. So I would highly recommend reading Martin Blazer's book, The Missing Microbes. So Marty Blazer's whole life has been spent studying Helicobacter pylori, which is, what, what do you guys think of when you think of Helicobacter pylori? Ulcers. Ulcers, right? 
Ulcers and, and gastric cancer are things that come on post-reproductive. That is to say, after, after evolutionary selection pressure can act upon them. In other words, there's something you get when, typically when you get old. So um, at the t turn of the 20th century, Marty would tell you that 90% of all Americans carried Helicobacter pylori. And almost all of the people in the non-industrialized nations carried Helicobacter pylori. And um, by the turn of the 21st century, we have 10% carriage of Helicobacter pylori. So this is a microorganism that we've lo we're losing. And so um, <clears throat> now there's still really big carriage in the non-industrialized nations, despite the fact that ulcer and gastric cancer is a, is a disease of industrialized nations. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, it turns out, um, Marty would tell you that he believes that Helicobacter pylori is a co-evolved partner of humans. And there is a mouse, or excuse me, a rat model of asthma. And these, these rats have some genetic problem, and they get, they wheeze all the time, I guess. They, they have, these rats are, are, have asthma. If you colonize the gut of that rat with Helicobacter pylori, it resolves the asthma. And so what's happening there, I mean, it's the gut, but it's the lungs, right? You're putting it in the gut, but it's the lungs. Well, what, what that is, is obviously the, the presence of Helicobacter is somehow tuning the immune system so that it's something, Marty would tell you that it's a co-evolved partner that we've lost. And it's, and it's one of the things that they think is important for tuning the immune system. And so what autoimmune diseases are, and asthma, they're, they're diseases that are um, imbalances in the immune system, typically the adaptive immune system. There are imbalances there. And so, What's happening is there's something called the hygiene hypothesis that says that we're just too clean. That's the first thing. We don't get exposed enough, you know, you should tell your kids to go out and eat dirt. Like, they have a tendency to do. I mean, do we think it's, it's a, a mystery why all children are constantly, you know, they have, a, they have an oral fixation. I mean, what's that, I mean, is that, what, is that completely maladaptive? Um, and so, so, you know, we've gotten away from being the, the, the or, and, and apparently farm children are among the, the most um, immunologically healthy of, of all of the, the kids. People that have dogs and cats, apparently, um, who raise their children with dogs and cats, the children have very much healthier immune systems. So, you know, it's the, largely the hygiene hypothesis, and there are some very specific characters like Helicobacter pylori. So Marty thinks that all children should be inoculated with Helicobacter pylori. And then when, they, when they're older, if they happen to get an ulcer or gastric cancer, then you can cure it. <laughs> but, you know, they haven't in, in very, their formative years when they should have gotten it from their mother um, in, through the birth canal or in breastfeeding, and they haven't gotten it in those formative years, they won't develop an immune system that is not, that is not properly tuned. Well, let's thank Margaret for an excellent talk. <laughs>